Hello, everyone, and welcome to this evening's virtual book club. I'm Robert Newman, President and Director of the National Humanities Center, and I'm your host for this evening's event. Before we start, I want to remind everyone that you'll need to log into YouTube to participate in the discussion. You can do that by clicking on the blue sign in button in the upper right hand corner of the page using your Gmail account. This is the next to last event in our summer virtual book club series, where we've been talking with scholars whose work explores the long history and the complex dynamics of racial oppression in the United States. Our guest this evening is scholar, writer, and activist, Alexis Pauline Gums. Alexis identifies proudly as a queer Caribbean author and scholar in the tradition of Audre Lorde, June Jordan, and Jackie Alexander, and others. And her scholarly work on topics ranging from Black coding practices, to queer Caribbean poetics, to mothering in hip hop culture, has appeared in dozens of edited collections and academic journals. Her award-winning poetry and fiction have been published in numerous journals, earning her appointments as poet in residence at Makeshift Magazine, and as creative writing editor at Feminist Studies. Alexis's talents have been recognized with honors that include Ardard College's Outstanding Young Alumna Award, and she's been named one of Utney Reader's 50 Visionaries Transforming the World, as well as one of the Advocate Magazine's 40 Under 40, also Go Magazine's 100 Women We Love, and Color Line's 10 LGBTQ Leaders Transforming the South. The scope of Alexis's intellectual, creative, and oracular writing may best be represented by her triptych of experimental works, Spill, Scenes of Black Feminist Fugitivity, published in 2016, M Archive, After the End of the World, published in 2018, and Dub, Finding Ceremony, which was published earlier this year. Collectively, these three books demonstrate the impossibility of delineating between art, science, spirit, scholarship, and politics as we seek to achieve a better world. Alexis will shortly be a fellow this year at the National Humanities Center, working on two projects, a biography of Audre Lorde and a book about the Black Feminist Transnational History of Essence magazine. She's kindly agreed to talk with us tonight about the middle volume in her triptych, M Archive. Please join me in welcoming Alexis Gums. Alexis. Thank you so much. I'm so excited, so honored to be here. So happy to see everyone in the chat. Yes, all the love, all the love. And so I just want to ask you to get at least 15% more comfortable than you already are, wherever you are sitting, laying down, standing, I don't know, right now. And if we could take three deep breaths together, that would be great. I'm gonna mark my inhale and my exhale. You can breathe with me or you can breathe at your own pace. And here I go. Inhaling and exhaling. Inhaling and exhaling. One more time, inhaling. Maybe a loud exhale. <sighs> okay, we are here. I'm gonna do an initial reading and I just invite you to allow it to wash over you like a meditation. This thing about one body. It was the black feminist metaphysicians who first said it wouldn't be enough, never had been enough, was not the actual scale of breathing. They were the controversial priestesses who came out and said it in a way that people could understand, which is the same 
as saying they were the ones who said it in a way that the foolish would ignore and then complain about and then co-opt without ever mentioning the black feminist metaphysicians again, like with intersectionality, but that's another apocalypse. The Lord of their understanding had taught them. This work began before I was born and it will continue. The university taught them through its selective genocide, one body, the unitary body. One body was not a sustainable unit for the project at hand. The project itself being black feminist metaphysics, which is to say, breathing. Hindsight is everything and also one of the key reasons that the individual body is not a workable unit of impact. But if the biochemists had diverted their energy towards this type of theoretical antioxidant around the time of the explicit emergence of the idea, let's say the end of the second to last century, everything could have been different. If the environmentalists sampling the ozone had factored this in, the possibilities would have expanded exponentially. That wouldn't have happened. And of course we see that it didn't because of the primary incompatibility, the constitutive element of individualism being adverse, if not antithetical to the dark feminine, which is to say everything. To put it in tweetable terms, they believed they had to hate black women in order to be themselves. Even many of the black women believed it sometimes, which is also to say that some of the people on the planet believed they themselves were actually other than black women, which was a false and impossible belief about origin. They were all in their origin, maintenance and measure of survival, more parts black women than anything else. It was like saying they were no parts water, which they must have believed as well. You can see what they did to the water. The problematic core construct was that in order to be sane, which is to live in one body, which is to live one lifetime at one time, which is to disconnect from the black simultaneity of the universe, you could and must deny black femininity and somehow breathe. The fundamental fallacy being obvious now, obscured at the time, that there is no separation from the black simultaneity of the universe, also known as everything, also known as the black feminist pragmatic intergenerational sphere. Everything is everything. They thought escaping the dark feminine was the only way to earn breathing room in this life. They were wrong. You can have breathing and the reality of the radical black porousness of love, AKA black feminist metaphysics, AKA us, all of us, us, or you cannot. There is only both or neither. There is no either or. There is no this or that. There is only all. This was their downfall. They hated the black women who were themselves a suicidal form of genocide. So that was it. They could only make the planet unbreathable. Let's take three more deep breaths. Inhaling and exhaling and inhaling and exhaling. One more time, inhaling. for a breathable world. Okay, so thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being here. I'm excited and honored to be part of this series of the National Humanities Center Book Club. I really wanna honor and share gratitude for the impulse that the National Humanities Center had to focus the book club at this time on race and injustice. And I see it my participation, but also this whole series, which has been so amazing so far. And I know next week will be amazing also. I see it in the tradition of what Sylvia Winter asked of the humanities in the wake of the um, Rodney King verdict when she wrote the important essay, No Humans Involved, NHI, which of course I recommend to you if you haven't read it yet. And 
In this essay, Sylvia Winter, who is one of the, I feel, most brilliant theorists of our time, um, certainly somebody who, as an intellectual historian, has made everything that I do possible. She also was one of the people who had an incredible impact on the humanities through her work at Stanford University to create the, some of the disciplines that exist right now in terms of ethnic studies and black studies. And she said in the wake of the Rodney King verdict that it was actually her colleagues in the humanities who had to take responsibility for why it was thinkable, why it was thinkable that there could be a code, no humans involved, that the Los Angeles Police Department would use in order to say that Black people were not human enough to deserve any human rights, right? And we see this in the police brutality that actually was the trigger for this focus in this book club. And so I'm thinking about Sylvia Winter and what it means to take responsibility for what is thinkable. Those of us who work as scholars, those of us who are educators, those of us who are artists, are doing the work of what world is imaginable. And Sylvia Winter really holds us accountable to that. And I see this series in that tradition of accountability and I'm really grateful to be able to be a part of that. So I have um, so much to say. Obviously from what I read already, you understand that the content of M Archive is very much on this theme around race and injustice, but also this evening's format is gonna be a little bit different than some of the past book club evenings have been because the other thing about M Archive is that in its methodology and in its form, it also is um, queer to the humanities in a particular way. It, it also is, is seeking to undo racism, to rethink the human in its form. And so in our form of how we get to interact tonight, we're also gonna engage in that way. So I'm really excited for all of you who have signed in. And as Robert said, you, you do have to sign in <laughs> to YouTube to be able to participate in the chat. And I'll be interacting with the chat. I have it up right here and I'm happy to see all the snaps and I'm happy to see so many folks from North Carolina and from around the world who have tuned in. We are gonna use this space together the entire time because one of the imperatives, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, of the formal intervention that I am creating is that the life and labor of Black people is not simply to be consumed or extracted. We actually get to participate, all of us, together in creating life. So you all will not have to be passive listeners <laughs> to me that get to then ask your questions at the end this time. We're actually gonna practice in honor of our wise elder, Sylvia Winter, we're gonna practice doing the humanities differently and see what we learn from the practice and also from any insights I might share. And so the first thing that I would say is that M Archive is a book and this, the whole experimental triptych, one of the formal and methodological interventions it makes is in relationship to citation. And so each of these books cite one black feminist theorist over and over and over and over and over again on every single page of the book, the footnote goes to a set of texts by, in the case of Spill, Portent Spillers, in the case of this book, M Archive, M Jackie Alexander, and in the case of Dub, which is, which is the most recent book, Sylvia Winter herself. And that is a form of, it's a form of reparation. It is a form of, uh, performance and drawing attention to the fact that I do not believe that Black feminist theorists are cited enough, even when folks are doing work that does build on the, on the interventions they've made in the past. But it also is honest. For me, it's very honest to cite these theorists who have had such an impact on me that anything that I say has been made possible. The path has been made for what I do in this book, M Archive, by M. Jackie Alexander. So it's also a form of dedication. And the book is dedicated to Jackie, not just 
in the sense of writing on the first page, shout out to <laughs> Jackie Alexander, but in the sense of on each page, I'm conscious of being with her, being with her work, in particular, being with her questions in her book, Pedagogies of Crossing, the questions that she asks in there are present for me on every single page. And in methodological terms, that has to do with my desire to find a way to be in lineage, not simply through citation, but also through inquiry and being with. I didn't want to be complicit in a project of mastery, of saying I have mastery over, for example, the insights of an earlier generation or even a research archive that I'm intimate with. What I really wanted to do was to create a space where I could be intimate with a particular theorist at a particular time in their work and to do that at a particular time in my own life every single day. So that's part of the process that created this dedication. And so I want to invite you to dedicate your participation for the rest of our time together, our 45 minutes that we have left together, to someone who really has an impact on who it's possible for you to be in this moment, what it's possible for you to even think about at this time. It could be somebody who has been a great teacher to you, like Jackie Alexander has been to me, it could be somebody who's older than you, who's younger than you, who's in a completely different field than you. It could be somebody who is of a different species, not understood to be human, but that really has to do with what it's possible for you to think at this time. And this will be your first prompted way to participate in the chat. If you would please type in the chat the name of who you're dedicating your participation to and why. So as I said, I'm dedicating my participation to M. Jackie Alexander. And the reason that I'm dedicating this to her is many reasons. Of course, the book wouldn't exist without her because I'm engaging her on every page of it. But I also feel her very present with me in terms of even the different way of holding space for this book club because Jackie was the first person who I knew uh, I had the honor of getting to visit one of the classes that she taught when she was when she was a visiting chair at Spelman College and she started all of her seminars actually with the students and herself all meditating for 15 minutes before they did anything before they talked about the reading before they figured out had they got the assignment right she did that and i i saw and felt that intervention in a in a profound way and it absolutely has impacted my asking you to breathe with me and everything that we're going to do tonight. So I'm excited to see who you're dedicating to as you type it in the chat. And I encourage you to look there too, to see who you're welcoming. We're welcoming all of those into the chat who may be people who are living now, who may be people who have lived before but who you're dedicating your participation, presence, and attention to tonight. Mm. Oh yes, I love this. I love seeing you post about people who've opened your mind. Mm. Yes. The creative practices that have shaped the way you can think. I love seeing that. Mm -hmm. People in your family and direct lineage who've made it possible for you to be here. Mm -hmm. This is so beautiful. And I do want to say that this practice of dedication, I think, is, is operating in, in scholarly work. I often see that people's books are dedicated to other people. I think about one of my mentors and intellectual mothers, Farah Jasmine Griffin, and her incredible essay that the mothers may soar and the daughters may know their names that she dedicated to her mentor, Nellie McKay. And I think that this practice of dedication, of really thinking about who makes it possible for us to be here in an, in an intimate sense, even if that intimacy has just been how the person's artwork has blown our mind, 
can actually allow us to relate to each other in inquiry, in question, in, in critique, in debate, in a way that is more grounded in the love that has made us possible. I think it really makes a difference in the way that we interact. And I do think it, it has to do with what Sylvia Winter is talking about, about how could something called the humanities be actually more humane than what it has been designed to be within a colonial project. So I love all of this. I love all of this. And I, I love how it can also caught, like you all can find each other because some of you are inspired by the same people. And I hope that people stay in touch and connect to each other, especially if you can figure out the relationship between your YouTube name and your <laughs> regular name. <laughs> anyway, so that is beautiful. I appreciate, I appreciate, appreciate you for doing that tonight. I invite you to do that whenever at the beginning of anything that you want to bring, um, bring some specificity and lineage and love into some depth citation, maybe we would say. And the next part of how I feel that M Archive is an intervention in form is the fact that it is in every sense a nonlinear text. And the desire that I had in terms of the way that I organized this book is that instead of a reader reading about things I have researched and made sense of and then getting to consume them, like I mentioned earlier, this is a book where you as the reader are in the position of being the archivist, the future archivist after the end of the world, who is doing something very similar to what I do and what other researchers do who work with primary materials, looking at evidence of events and lives and situations that you can't actually touch, that I didn't get to actually participate into, that I am after, but I am organizing a story about who were these people at this time? What was this moment? What was even this um, Black feminist retreat not that many decades ago that the Kambahi River Collective put together looking only at the surveys and notes that came out afterwards and the letters and correspondence that came afterwards. And so often as a, as a researcher who um, is a generation removed from some of the um, core of my obsession and the Black feminist organizations and thinkers that have shaped me, I feel that I am after that world. And I feel that I am piecing together through the material evidence, through the um, the listening that I get to do and through primary archival research, what that world has to teach me in this moment and could possibly teach all of us. And that is the type of positionality that I wanted to offer to the reader. What if we imagined what it would be like for people in the future, when I wrote this, I thought it was far into the future, but some of these apocalyptic things have already happened. So <laughs> that's its own, um, that's its own lesson to me. But people who may not even get to hear in our own voices us saying what it was like to be alive at this time of transformation, what will they have? What sense will they make of what we did? What will they think we believed about water? Considering that for so many of the mothers and children on the planet, they have more access to Coca-Cola than they have access to clean water. And Coca-Cola has more access to clean water than the families of the world do. What would they think that we believed about water? What would they conclude from the archive that we leave behind through our action? And so um, tonight we're gonna engage the text in a non-linear way. And we're gonna look at the questions that we actually have now about the impact that we're having that will outlive us. And so if what we leave behind us is a material archive of actions, if what we leave behind us is a um, creative archive of what we have made as artists, if what we leave behind us is actually just an energetic situation that some people in the future are gonna have to tap into however they can, I'm interested in what the question is for you 
at this moment of adaptation that would provide you the most generative insight about who to be in this moment of change. And so this is what we call an oracle question. I like to call it a Lordian question sometimes in the name of Audrey Lord, because it can be the type of question that can make your voice shake, but you don't have to say it out loud. You just get to type it in the chat. And I, I want to distinguish between this type of question and the types of questions that are um, mostly in circulation in academic spaces. So usually in academic spaces, I know that um, I often ask questions that I already know the answer to. I often um, create questions that are actually just packages for things that I want us to talk about and that I actually know are important. And I think that there's definitely a place for that. But these oracle questions, we can have some of the other type of questions towards the end, but these oracle questions are things that you really wonder about for yourself. And we're taking this personally again, because um, we ask different questions. When we're asking um, critical, insightful questions about the state of the world and about the collective, sometimes we're a little bit more removed from what's at stake for us in those questions about how we live through the next moment, about how we impact the future beyond, beyond our own breathing. So an example of an oracle question, a Lordian oracle question is, what do I, Alexis, need to stop doing in order to make space for the future I'm responsible for? That is a question that I do not know the answer to. <laughs> and that's scary, you know, a little bit scary for me to ask out loud and especially have answered in front of everyone. But that's a real question that's there for me. What do I need to stop doing in order to let through the future that I'm responsible for? So you can put your questions in the chat, one addition. So you're going to think of your question and then a number between one and 212. Can be any number, whole number between one and 212. And it can be the, the number for any reason. It can have just popped into your head. It can be your age. It could, you can have a favorite number because you know, we nerds, we are the book club. You might just have a favorite number. Any whole number between one and 212. And so if you would please in the chat, type your question and the number, and I'm gonna engage that. The way that it activates the Oracle is that is the page that I will read in response to your question from M Archive. And we hopefully will have time to do at least seven of these. Starting with mine. So as you remember, my question was, what do I need to stop doing in order to make space for the future I am responsible for to come through? And the number that I am choosing is 202. And this is what it says on page 202. She was learning to wait. She was trying to learn to wait. Hold up was that space in front of her chest as she moved towards a person, knowing she would rather be holed up in her room reading maps. So she made a miracle stitch of pockets and dropped heart oil and crystals into them. Sometimes she could read their hearts from 10 feet away. She put the magic in her hands and breathed forward. Okay, so let me say that um, when I wrote that, I would have no idea that I would be in a situation where breathing, I would need to actually be about 10 feet away from people in order to be, um, in order to be responsible and safe and protect them from the possibility that I um, carry a contagious 
disease that uh, I may not even have symptoms for, but I am reminded of that when I read this. What does it mean to create the technology where I can read your heart from 10 feet away, even if we're both wearing masks and I can't tell that you are smiling at me? And when I put it in relationship to the question that I asked about what do I need to stop doing I think that there is something about the honesty. It says she would rather be holed up in her room reading maps. And that's true. That's, that's very true for me most times, most days. And I do have a way of saying yes to proximity, even if it's digital proximity, proximity from a place of guilt. Like I don't deserve the space to do the solitary work that actually is very important and is very necessary, even just for the intellectual projects that I'm bringing through. So I feel like that's how this particular page reads me. I'll also tell you that um, for, for the citation in Pedagogies of Crossing, the line that I was inspired by says, hold on to what holds you up. So that's what Jackie had to say. Okay, so that's how the Oracle works. I went first because I would not ask you to do anything that I'm not willing to do myself, but you don't have to read them out loud because you are here in the chat. Okay, perfect. So there's so many questions in here, definitely more than seven, so you know what page of the book to look at if you need to. And conveniently for, for my book sales, that means you just have to get the book, but I'm gonna do as many as I can in the time that we have allotted. So first we have Jillian who says, what does it mean to be unbothered? How do I be unbothered? Okay, so eight, this is page eight. And if anybody else chose page eight, this is for you. And then there was the muscle called the heart. At one stage of human history, they like to say it was the size of the fist. This was one way they admitted how central extremity was. And the fist lifting people were sincere. They imagined they could show their hearts, lift them up and out of their chests, make their blood flow vulnerable and coordinated. That is what they meant. But of course it was as anatomically irrelevant as those European medieval anatomists who insisted that the heart was directly in the middle of the body or that the stomach was the organ of love or even those patriots who imagined the heart always already on the right side of the chest. What we have to remember about the human heart is that yes, it was a muscle. Yes, it was central. Yes, it was vulnerable when it was. And so when the toxicity of the species developed to the point where extremities started freezing and falling off. You'll remember that one of the first results of the fracked water was deep interruptions in circulation. The idea of the heart had to change. The engaged heart, temporarily measured by small machines that people wore to count their steps and movements and calories, developed a counter rate that communicated something other than the conditioning of the individual. It ticked like the urgency of action. And so in the end, those specific people who had used the colloquial name for the heart, ticker, were closest to being right. And of course, at this point, it goes without saying that they were, to be colloquial again, running out of time. Mm. So what does it mean to be unbothered? Yeah, I think that this particular passage is about um, really what is an engaged heart? What does it mean to have an engaged heart in a way that, um, in a time that feels scarce, but is also threatened by the um, disengagement, right? It talks about the fracking. It talks about the, um, it talks about the heart having to be understood again on a scale beyond the individual. And so what does it mean to be unbothered? 
What does it mean to have a disengaged heart? What does it actually mean? What does it actually cost? What is its real relationship to something like peace or autonomy or um, the confidence and resilience that I hear when I hear the term unbothered used colloquially? Yeah, that's what I would think about. Mm, beautiful. Okay, so we got Alicia Sharma who says, how can I take control over my experience of touch, self-touch and to another when so much of my experience of it is seeped in violence, isolation and negation, page 59. That's deep. I'm so glad y'all brought your deep questions. I appreciate it. Okay, 59, they started putting X's on the places without treasure, without pleasure in their memories, without hope. Sometimes all they had to mark them was their own blood. Sometimes the markings were as temporary as chalk, as sincere as cornmeal. This is how the ground looked as the people gave up. Almost every spot, a crossroads saying, leave. This is no staying place. No place to dig for life or plant a question. Sometimes in their tired wandering, the people would come across warnings in their own hands and they would shake their heads, feel stinging in their dried out eyes because here they were back in a place they had marked unworthy of return. That was when the people realized there had to be something after giving up because there were no more places to leave. What do you do with a planet of excuses, scarred and unwelcome, inviting only absence? X marks the spot, not here. Mm. So reading this, especially in response to your really deep generative question is what I see there is that we can be really good, and this is this is a part of the way I think about the humanities also. Really, we can be really good at being like, not this, not this. There's a problem with this, there's a problem with this, there's a problem with this, there's a problem with this. And especially whatever we have survived with um histories of trauma, it's like that's not safe, that's not safe, that's not safe. I, you know, there's a familiarity of unsafety and it's abundant and it becomes everywhere, right? There's a there's a hypervigilance where we do see it everywhere, the unsafety that we have already experienced. And so reading this passage in response to this question, again, has me think about it in a way I've never thought about it before, which is why this interactive approach is so important to me. And I'm so grateful to you all for participating in it. What it says to me is, it's actually not about finding a place clear of any negative energy, any negative memories. It's about rededicating the space that exists in a new way now. So X marks the spot not here is for me the, this pivot point that's asking for presence. What does it take for us to be presence, present to a situation that is not perfect, that is not clean, that is not without horrifying histories related to it, but to be able to be there in a way that says, you know what? I have been here before and I can be here now differently. That's what I would say. And I love that question. And I love that task of reclaiming, taking control of my experience of touch. That's really powerful. And we have Jillian, where do I start? That's a question. I feel like that's a question for a lot of us on a lot of days. And it's page 107. which says, this is what it takes to cool the planet, hold the world together, protect the mysteries, despite the surface violence and the pollution you try to bury in your heart. This is what it takes, the strength of no separation, the bravery of flow, the audacity of never saying, this is me, this is not you. This is mine, this is not yours. 
This is now. This was not ever before. If you listen, each drop is saying always, always, which is homonym with right now, right now. Listen to the ocean, let go and become one. Let go and remain depth. Let go and just be everywhere. Salt particles aligned with the stars in the sky. Start there. And that is, by the way, the very first passage in uh, the section called Archive of the Ocean. Yeah, start there, Jillian. Thank you for that question. Thank you, our multiple different Jillians. Okay, so we have David's question. What does it mean to be a good person for this generation and all those that came before and will come after? It's a big question and I love it. I think it's absolutely at the heart of what is this inquiry? Like how, how do we be now accountable to our history and our future? So 125, she stands at the portal again, breathing heavy through salt. X marks the back of her hands. All her dry cracked skin, all star opening pores, she is never ready but the person in front of her falls. The people behind her whipped open and trudging through the door, onto the boat, into the belly, onto the deck, into the ocean again, hoping to find a different passage out next time. So for me, this scene is about the portal, which is also the door of no return. Um, and it is in, I imagine it in the perspective of a person who has lived multiple lives and who has seen multiple iterations of um, this, this door of no return, which is, um, which is a, a literal place in the, in the dungeons where enslaved people were held as they were being put onto the ships. There were these small doors that you can only go one direction. And so I think about this as very powerful in terms of what you're asking, David, how to be a good person for this generation, accountable to who's behind you and who's in front of you, right? And this particular passage is very specific. She sees the person in front of her. She knows that what's happening to the people behind her. And she's not ready, but she holds the possibility, hope. Can you imagine in this situation, hoping to find a different passage out next time. That standing at the portal, unready, has this worthiness, that there's a possibility even in the repetition that we experience for something different to happen this time, which I would say is part of what Sylvia Winter was asking us about too. Like we can rethink what's thinkable such that we could organize life a different way by now. Mm-hmm, okay. So we have Daniel's question. What thing that I currently hold dear must I release in service of motion towards future light? Mm-hmm, 180. That resonates with me a lot. Mm -hmm. Their basements were not so much about keeping. I mean, look, the cluttered mantles and end tables, look, the bright family pictures layered on top the older family pictures, mailed year after year, all crowded in the same frame. Look how the whole place become an altar to looking well. Pose and posture and figurines and cookie tins and evidence of other empires to leverage out the one we living in. It smells like we cook in a particular form of magic and not everyone can cross this threshold. See where we place the mirror so you can see yourself out if you come with malice. No one's saying obia, but no one's saying feng shui either. We have much, but we don't have much to put away. And really we used to live in at sea level properly or in rented rooms temporarily or if it's what they call extra space, soon enough some cousin in there sleeping. So basement 
is not a thing we really study like how you study it. Or say basement is not a place where we put things we want to keep and ignore. But in some houses, and you only know if you should know, deep in the house is a place of blood and transformation, shells and seeds and knowing, a place of remembering and washing, a place of guidance and entrancement. And only the brave would dream to sleep there, but who know more duppy than we? They out duppy duppy in the basement, deep in the backyard, in the off display places at home. Living room is like the jewelry, layered and loud with performance. What you call the basement, we would call the heart, where blood run thick. Mm. Okay, well, Daniel, I do and do not know what is dear to you, but I hope that that is helpful in terms of um, this particular piece coming out of a um, West Indian migrant perspective, which is um, a perspective of my lineage of thinking about the basement, not as a place of storage, but as a place of spiritual work. And I know you know exactly what to do with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we have about four more minutes until I turn it back over. So, mm -hmm. all these questions are so, so good. Okay, so let's go with Eric's question. How can I clearly, most clearly remember and express ancestral practices of black joy apart from the presence of capitalism that co-ops and commodifies them? That is such a good question. Very core to what I was hoping to talk about here structurally and very timely, yes. Okay, so this is page 90. Ooh, okay. So Eric, this is page 90. It is an excerpt of the periodic table and the elements that are there are hydrogen, iron, nitrogen, helium, and neon. This is the archive of fire. So there's something about this um, beauty of this question of remembering and expressing ancestral practices of black joy in a way that is not commodifiable that has to do with fire. And one of the things that Jackie Alexander writes is she says, remember the character of fire. What is the character of fire? It's transformative, right? Whatever fire interacts with changes. It can move from a state. It can move from a liquid state to a gas state. It can move from a solid state to a liquid state. It, um, it is often transformed beyond return to its former form. It's a key, the fire within us and fire as we understand it external to us are so key in that carbon cycle. And so I would say that there's something elemental about your ancestral practices of joy that are, um, yeah, too hot to hold it in your hand and absolutely transformative in what they do. Not solid enough to be um, exchanged. Mm, I feel like I talk about that all day. I love that question. Okay, so in this one minute, and I feel like this also relates to Ms. Duke's question about acquiring material goods. I um, love these questions about um, the creative work. Oh, I really want to read page 47 and 97, talking about preparing for children. I just want to say that I know that Robert needs these last 10 minutes to do, is that right? These last 10 minutes to do the... Please go ahead. Oh, okay, okay, so let's let's do this. So, Fadeke, we have shifting out of my own way to make space for new creative work and loving in a healthy way to self and others. 47 says, it started on our tongues. Ooh, are you ready for this? Okay, it started on our tongues. Everyone thought it was the water, the lack of water, the genetically processed seeds that didn't need water to thrive. Or it could have been 
the post ozone air. The tongue is sensitive like that. And we were living in a world didn't taste right. That was for sure. So we explained the sores and tried to cure them with oil pulling and tonics. Didn't work. Once the sores got everywhere, on the bottoms of our feet, on the palms of our hands, someone said it might've been our bloodstreams, bad blood with the planet, recirculating through our straining hearts. Some people even started to breed leeches. It only got worse. It hurt to move. It hurt to breathe. The food decline plateaued because it hurt so much to eat. And we were thick in our clothes from swelling. And when our eyes swole shut, we couldn't see. And then we finally saw. We saw it. We hadn't told the truth in so damn long. That's 47. So I know you're ready for it because you asked for this, this particular question. I think it is moving out of our own way, right? What, what are the areas in which we haven't told the truth in so long that we are not able to, um, to move through? Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited for your creative shift. And Tiana Lee is preparing for the children. So let's do 90. Seven. A lot of sevens you all have chosen. Okay. Okay, Tiana. What we wanted was to want to, not to have to do anything. And the problem was we forgot after all these years of force what wanting was. Want was not getting, nor was it having. Want was not needing. Wanting was not having to have or needing not to need. It was not. And there was a wideness in wanting that didn't quite fold in on itself. It deepened and rose up and radiated out and touched softly to itself with warm warning. That's the preparation. Really the difference between want like what is want for real? The difference between what we want and what we feel we have to do was a big question for me. It remains a big question for me. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do one more. Page 126 for Ms. Dukes. Mm -hmm. How do I cease acquiring material goods because I have more than enough? and start sharing items I've collected with family and community so the impact of these gifts can be most beneficial. Yes, 126. Oh, Ms. Dukes, your intuition. Okay, this is what it says. You cannot carry this in here, a voice said. And she knew it meant her gorgeous leather luggage filled with grief and her recently polished, frequently restained vanity case of violences received and held like love notes. But this is who I am, she said, offering her matching identification stamped with lies. This is who I am, she repeated, trusting the documentation that had gotten her through everything so far. And there was no answer except for her blood and her breathing, quick, with the beat of how much she had paid already, except for her back, stiff with how she could not, could not turn back around. And so she stood there at the border with not so much as a plastic chair to support her detainment, with only her shiny suitcases as witness, packed completely full with rolled up excuses. Gently rolled up excuses. She stood there at the border, a line drawn in sand and the desert blew around her. And she stood there at the border while the tide advanced. She stood there at the border. Then she took a deep breath, pushed both empty hands forward and swam. I think you got, I think you got what you needed to get. 
Um, last one, page five, how can I write fearlessly? I love that question. And mm, all right, this is the last one. Divide by the deaths you had to metabolize yesterday. Divide by the shot echoes in your dreams. Divide by the sleep you didn't get thinking you had to hustle harder. Divide by the water you didn't drink either. Multiply by every pore touched, every memory made skin again, every word of love and the lips that share them. Multiply by the sound of children, the sound that never stops, exponent of the will of the ancestors, which will be dreamt but not slept through. All things are not equal. Wake up. Okay. Write fearlessly. I think, SM, I think you, I think you have your instructions very clearly. Thank you all so, so much for engaging in this way. The generosity of your questions is very moving to me. Thank you for allowing us to engage in, um, in a nonlinear way and for teaching me so much. I feel like this is one of the things that Jackie Alexander says. She says, the message is always for the diviner. So if these questions were read to you, they all are instructions <laughs> for me also. And I just feel so grateful getting to learn with you and getting to be with you. And thank you so much, Alexis, uh, for a presentation that was simultaneously challenging and engaging and just wonderfully generative. Uh, we appreciate it so much. Um, I also want to thank everyone who joined us tonight and for your wonderful participation uh, in this presentation. This event has been recorded and it will be available here on the National Humanities Center YouTube channel. You should please click the follow button and the notify bell below this video to be notified of future live events and other videos from the center. You can also go to nationalhumanitycenter.org to find out more about other events that we sponsor, as well as about uh, more about our mission. Finally, I hope you will join us next Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern time uh, for the final presentation in this uh, book club series, virtual book club series on racial injustice. Our guest will be historian Martha Jones, who will be discussing her book, Vanguard, how black women broke barriers, won the vote, and insisted on equality for all. Everyone, good evening, and please stay well. Thank you so much. <laughs>